maybe it takes one more step to get in the center or so, but it's now the center, and I haven't found the right clusters. Right? You can't have problems with with um, with k-means where it doesn't find the right solution with Lloyd's iron. Sometimes it gets stuck in a situation like this, and it's it's not going to give you centers and all the clusters. Even though if, if I ran this, this simpler algorithm, this Gonzales algorithm, it, it worked. And it's hard to, if the clusters are this kind of um, well behaved, it's hard to, to fool um, Gonzales algorithm. Um, but it didn't, um, but the Lloyd's algorithm got stuck if all of my clusters started all together in one spot. And it wound up in this situation. Um, um, so, so Lloyd's algorithm doesn't always work. It sometimes gets stuck in these local minimums. Um, and a lot of these algorithms which iterate on this stuff, this, this can be a problem that happens. Um, so, um, so, so what are the possible solutions for a case like this? Do what? A combination of the Gonzalez and um, yeah, right. Um, so, so, how, so how would you combine these two algorithms? Maybe run Gonzalez first and run the first two. Yeah. Three of the center. Yeah. Right. Um, good, right. So, so what you can do is, is pretty much what you said is you can run Gonzalez algorithm and use, so don't actually do this arbitrarily. Don't just pick you know, any points you want, you'll end up getting points, you may end up getting points together, and then it'll take more steps for it to converge, and it may not converge to the right thing. Instead, run Gonzales algorithm, and use this as your seed of the case centers, and then you can run Lloyd's algorithm, and that will tend to move these points from Gonzales algorithm, it'll move these towards the center of, of the clusters. Right, so if you run this, it'll find the main clusters and then it'll move it towards the center. Um, so, it's, um, um, so, um, so doing this is is good. This is this is often a good um, a good way of doing this. However, it's it's not always a great solution. The reason why we don't always just run this Gonzales algorithm. And why we don't always want the case center, and we would rather run the k-means algorithm, is that this one is often very susceptible to outliers. If you have one outlier, you'll always pick it as a center. And if your point is an outlier, um, if you pick the point out here, it's not going to be, it's not going to help you finding um, these correct centers. Um, and and you'll tend to get, you know you'll tend not to ever assign any other points to here, so it, this center won't ever move. You will never reassign points to a center very far away, typically. So when you do the re-averaging, it's just an average of one point. And so you're not going to ever move the center off of the outline. So Lloyd's can still get stuck <coughs> if you have one of these outliers. <coughs> so that might, if, if you really care about this cost function, this might not be a bad thing. If it is an outlier and there aren't too many points, then it may be that you actually do want to spend the center out here. It, will, it may actually minimize the sum of the squared distances. Because let's say I, 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 if I picked you know, this as the center, this distance is actually going to be pretty large. And maybe I'd be, if this was really far away, maybe I'd be better off having one center cover these two and, and, a, and, and a different center cover over here. Um, really probably you'd want more than three clusters is really the solution, but let's say we're trying to optimize for K, for a fixed K, in this case three, then I might want to spend one, one center here and take one of these guys and assign it down to this outlier. Maybe that's the better solution. So, so sometimes that's the right solution, but that's, the, the, the time of that is not the case when you have outliers that you don't want to spend your centers on, but will still get stuck with Gonzales algorithm, is when you really have a lot of points here. Then, if even, even one point really far off is not going to pull the mean too much. Maybe the mean, 
this, this average point will still be here, but it'll be pretty close to these points, and you won't have too much cost. You're better off non assigning the center here. If you really have a lot of points here. Um, okay, so if you really had a lot of points here, there's other ways you can you can choose these these points initially, which will work better for outliers in in this case. So let's see. So um, let's see. So the first option was Gonzales algorithm, but this would get um, can get fooled by um, by points which are outliers. Okay. Um, so what, what, what's a way that will not get fooled by outliers as much? You have a small number of outliers really far away. So the next most obvious thing is just to pick a random set of key points as, you, as your centers. So if, if there are really only, say, three clusters, and you pick these points, you're, you're probably going to pick points in each of these clusters. Well, actually, we have looked at the, the, at, at the uh, coupon collectors problem in the first lecture in class, right? And so the coupon collectors problem was you're trying to draw randomly from a set of objects and you want to find one from each of the centers. Now, because there are a small number of outliers, the probability of picking these is really low and you probably don't have to worry about it. So you're probably going to draw from points in these centers, but you may not get points in all of the centers. Um, so you're, you're better off, instead of key points, um, if you pick k log k points, then you're more likely to get at least one point in all the centers. Um, so you can pick these centers, then you can run Lloyd's on these centers and get only k things remaining, and then use those as your as your with some extra, what was it? It was actually this, this, this uh, gamma constant, or k times this gamma constant times natural log of n. But then you're likely to get one point in each of these centers. That's the expected number you do. If you probably did twice that many, you're probably pretty likely to do that. Um, um, so that's definitely one way how to do it. Um, so, um, there's another way people often um, suggest as a way of starting this, which is instead of choosing the centers at random, you can think of choosing the sets at random, where you randomly divide points into sets, compute all of their centroids, and then you know, um, and then um, compute all the centroids of these, and then re-randomly, and then randomly, uh, and then. Uh, reassign the sets and repeat as your bootstrap. Um, this turns out not to work very well. What's going to happen is if you have lots of points, each set is going to be is going to have about the same representation, and it's going to be that your centers are all going to be around the same spot. If you remember using something like the like the Chernoff bounds, Chernoff Hawking bounds in the in the second lecture, then if you keep doing these random you know, repeated samples, you're tending to get the same average for each of your estimates. They're all not going to be very far off because you're a bunch of these small estimates. And so all your centers are going to be about the same spot. And then you're, you know, 
quite possibly not going to um, <laughs> divide up the data very well again. Um, or it's going to get some, maybe you can get some weird 1A diagram coming out like this, and in this case it worked. But it, it could have also been rotated, you know, uh, a little bit, where, you know, this point got both of these centers and you got stuck in the same situation you were before. So picking, so picking the random sets first and then doing this is, it, it's not a good technique. Okay, so, but these, these two techniques are, work pretty well, but there's something that combines both of these that's gonna work even better. Okay, this one gets fooled by outliers. This one, you might miss some points and it's, um, and, and, and you actually do want to pay attention to outliers sometimes, or some points that are at the extremes. These are gonna affect the cost more, and the, the randomly picking points is not gonna find these. So you somehow wanna combine these two together. And so there's a technique called um, k-means plus plus. And it's going to combine these two together. So it's going to run like this, um, like this Gonzales algorithm, where it's going to build up these centers one at a time. Um, and so then, for j equals to k, what we're going to do is um, choose ci from x um, proportional to from x to b of r i minus 1 from x squared. So what I'm going to do is so pick from x at random. So what I'm doing here is I'm just picking each center at random. And here I'm picking them the, the ones fur, the furthest away, I'm always picking the one obsolete furthest away. Here I'm picking them proportional to the distance. So the further it is from any of the centers, the more likely I am to pick it. And it's exactly the same cost function of that point. So the further it is from the center, the more likely I am to pick it. Okay, so, so it's, again, it's a very simple algorithm, except instead of the absolute for this one, I'm picking one kind of at random, but weighted, so I'm more likely to pick the far ones. So what's going to happen is that if I start out with, with the center here, I'm less likely to pick any of these points because their distance function is very small. And both all the points here and here have much larger distance functions, so I'm more likely to pick them. If I look at any one point, an outlier, it's probably the most likely point picked, but there are going to be a lot more of these points. So, so, these, are, so these points are going to be, um, I'm going to more likely pick one of these points than, than, this, than um, any one of these points than this one specific outline. Even though maybe it's twice as far, so it means its cost is four times as much as any one of these points, but there may be a hundred points here. So this may be, proportional 100 to 4, I'm much more likely to pick one of these. Um, okay, so the one part that's different, in Gonzales algorithm, I could find the max, right? So I calculate all these distances, and I, I take the one that's largest, right? That's easy to do. If I'm choosing one proportional, at random proportional to this distance, how do I do this? Does anyone know how to, how to implement this? I think every, every semester I've, I've taught some sort of class and I've always had to go over the algorithm to do this because people generally um, forget it. But if you've been in one of my classes before, I've explained this to you. But, so who's, who's been in even, even this seminar last semester? Well, I'll raise it. Um, how do I choose 
a point proportional to its squared distance at random. Okay, so I'm going to explain this again, right? So you can think of, you're going to have a set of objects and they each have a weight. You want to think of proportional to its weight. And this is something I find comes up in a lot of these randomized algorithms. And it's a very kind of important thing to do. And the right way to think about this is you're going to have, I'll do an example where I have objects one, two, three, four, five, and they have weights. I remember that picture. Oh, okay, now you remember it. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Actually, we sum all the weights, and after that, pick a random variable between these. And also partition it to, it, it, this summation into the. Uh, it's actually. Uh, pa partition it based on the weight, and whenever that we choose random, see. The random variable, the random variable, actually put in in which partition and pick that object. That object corresponding to that partition. Actually. Yes, correct. So I'll I'll explain it as with the picture, and it'll make make more sense. Um, okay, so, so let's do this. I'm going to have these eight elements, and you'll see why I choose eight a little bit later. And um, each of these is, is going to be given some weight. So, so this is the weight. This will be an example. So um, let's say 7, um, 15, 10, 30, um, 22, um, 2. Three. OK, so how, how much am I up to this? 52, 55, 57, uh, 74, 80, what? 89, okay, 11. Oh, they add up to 100, okay, good. Um, okay, so, so now I can think of these weights, and I can, you know, I can think of a proportion up to one. And now I can, the thing, a computer is very good at, you have this operation in the computer, is generate a ran, random number between 0 and 1. So I want to somehow generate a random number between 0 and 1 that gives me um, this, this, uh, this weight, right? Um, so I'm going to divide them up so that each element takes up the right proportion of this, where this is 0 and this is 1. And so I'm going to say up to 7 is here, up to um, 2 is, this is up to 22, or this is 0 0.7 and 0 0.22. Like by 100, right? Yeah, 0.32, this is 3, um, 4 is going to be bigger, um, I'm going to be up to 62, this is for 4, 63, 64, 64, 5 is going to be here, see I get up to 80, um, 84, um, then I'm going to have some small ones here. These are six and seven. This is eight, six, eight, six, nine, eighty-nine, and then this is eight. This, you know, one. Okay. So now I generate a random number um, at random between zero and one, and it's going to fall. Let's say in four. It falls between point. If this is. Um, 0.421, you know, off, right? It fell between 0.32 and 0.62, so that my choice was 4. So this is proportional to the weight. Um, right? Okay, so this is, so, so you can think of doing this, and so you can also just pick a random number and then multiply it between 0 and 1, multiply it by the sum of all these weights, right? This is. So if you have this, this big W, then you take this U, which is, um, is uniform in 0, 1, and you do U times big W, and this will then give you, um, and then you keep walking and adding up these weights until you reach U times big W, and this will tell you when to stop. So you can walk along this list. Okay.
Um, this works okay, but this is, you're walking along this list, and any computer scientist should feel, should, should feel ashamed if you're walking on a list, if, you're, if you don't have more structure there, right? Um, so if, if you have this, you should <laughs> you feel ashamed for thinking this was good for a second. No, <laughs> it's okay, you can admit it, so. Um, so, so in, instead you should be building, be building some sort of, some sort of binary tree, right? Um, so what you want to do instead is to, is to build a tree here. Um, I chose eight because it makes for a nice binary tree. And at every location, I'm going to store this, the sum here, 22, this is 40, this is 24, this is 14, this is um, 38, 62, and 100, right? Okay, so, so I, th this isn't actually, actually the thing I want to store. Um, I want to store actually seven here, just what's on the left side. Here I want to store 22, and here I want to store 62. I can do this by pushing these up. Um, and then here I want to store 22 plus what's on the left side, which is 10. This is 32. Here I want to store, um, uh, let's see, 62 plus 22. This is going to be uh, 84. Here I want to store, uh, oh no, plus 24. 62 plus 24, this is going to be 86. Here I want to store 84, and here 89. Okay, so, so now what happens, I come in with a random number, I multiply it by W, which is, which is 100, and now I'm going to have, could go in here, with a value of 42 point, you know, one, right? So, so, so this was my RAM number times the sum. And now if it's less than this, I, I go down to the left. If it's greater than this, so I, I go down this way. And then I, I keep going down and I reach, I reach four. And this only took log n steps instead of linear steps. So I needed to spend linear time to build this, but this is very simple to do. Right, so now I can generate a random thing in in, uh, in, in log n steps instead. Um, now it turns out you need to do linear time to build this anyway, so and these weights are changing, so maybe this didn't didn't uh, affect too much. But um, actually, not all the weights are changing every step. You only need to update the ones which are reassigned to the center. So you can you can update this and and of the number of things which are updated, which is about one over i. Um, so you can speed this up a little bit. But in, in general, this is a really useful structure. OK, so I kind of got distracted. Um, OK, so, so um, OK, I, so th this is how you implement this k means plus plus. And you can use this to then plug into the start of your centers here. And then you can optimize it further with Lloyd's algorithm. And, and this has some really nice, this Kenius plus plus has some really nice properties. Okay, so um, the first property is that it's already a log n approximation to the Kenius result. Um, so it means after you just ran this for k steps, you already in there's some probabilistic terms here where there's some delta probability of failure, but you're going to be within log n of the uh, of of the right of the optimal cost after you've run this um, with with some some small with some probability. Um, so if the data is uh, if there's some if there's some condition. On, on the data, um, say if the data is well spaced, there's some all the weird constructions which got like these crazy runtimes have some points really close together and some really far apart. 
And if you don't have a property like this, then it's going to be an eight um, approximation just by running this. So I, I haven't even tried to optimize this. I've already got eight approximation just by making this one pass, choosing these centers. Um, but, but even more, if I do this and then I plug it into the Lloyd's algorithm, um, then uh, I forget what the exact result is, but, but then it's, it's, it's going to run um, in, in, in a small number of, of, of steps. So it's, it's not going to, you can show that it's not going to get in these situations where you iterate back and forth some, some really large number of times. Um, these are pretty rare anyway, so this is not the big thing, but it means it's already an eight approximation on most inputs, on, on any reasonable input, and it's only going to improve it. Remember, the cost function decreases every time I run one of these steps. Right? So given the starting point, I can't get worse than eight approximation once I start there, so it's going to be a much better one after I run it. So even in crazy, Distributions that made up to make this seem like it's hard. Um, if you if you pre-process by this k-means, then you're not going to need too many steps in the Lloyd algorithm, and you're going to have um, a result which is good. And there's some theory paper which kind of tries to formalize all this, but you know, and it works well in practice too. Um, and there have been large-scale experiments that, that show this. So I, I recommend you know anytime you run Lloyd's to pre-process with something like this instead of instead of um, choosing points randomly where you can get in, into some trouble or arbitrarily which could be even worse. Um, okay, so is this, is, so, so we've run Lloyd's algorithm, we know how to choose points, we don't get into trouble, is, um, is, is uh, does this mean everything is solved in the world of cluster? Or are there still some issues we need to worry about? There's still issues, right? Okay. So, so what are the issues? Uh, I mean, I stopped posting the notes online early, I guess. Um, well, so okay. So, so what are the properties? So, they're the finding not complex. Yeah. Okay. okay so. Um, so, 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 so the, the problems are not so much with the algorithms that you want. The combination of the k means plus plus and the Lloyds works really well from the algorithms, from the perspective of the algorithms. The, the problem is more in how we pose the problem in this cost function. Right? This is one way of, 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 uh, of describing you know, how you, what you want to optimize for clustering. We talked about these hierarchical things last time, and as, as Reza was su suggesting, the, these, these other hierarchical methods can capture different shapes in, in, the, in the clusters that key means can't. The key means metric, and actually any of these assignment-based things, will somehow partition the points into these regions which are convex. So we had this example yesterday where you had some, some data points where it looked like there's this banana or something around this apple in the middle, right? And maybe you want these to be one cluster and this to be another cluster. And maybe you think, why would you ever have data that actually looks like this? Um, well, maybe in high dimensions you do, because some things lie in some curved subspace and something lies in another, and, and they're not necessarily convex separations that you can do. You can't draw a line that separates these, which is needed for any clustering under any of these Metric. Um, even if you do have these convex separations, you could have some example where your data looks kind of like this, um, where you have two smaller clusters. So you think k is three here. You want to have a cluster that looks like this, this, and this, right? Um, so the problem is that k-means is going to pick centers here, here, and here, and then the Borne diagram is going to look like this, and some of the points in the big cluster are going to be kind of assigned to the smaller clusters, um, when they really shouldn't be like that. 
it, the k-means kind of enforces that all the clusters are about the same shape. Um, and pretty much any of these, these, uh, these, these techniques, um, techniques do that. Now, there's one way around this. Um, there's this. There's there's this EM version of clustering, which kind of fits into here. And instead of using just the point as the center, it says the distribution is going to look like a Gaussian distribution. It's going to look like a distribution, and you can say some of the clusters are wider, and some are um, 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 some of these are going to be more narrow. So if you look at this from one dimension. You may have one cluster that looks like this, and inside of it, you're going to have another cluster that looks like a very sharp peak. And so maybe these points would all be in the red cluster, and then, you know, if, if you were doing a hard assignment, you would, you would draw lines kind of like this, where inside here are the red, but the green would have things outside as well. Um, so you could think of doing doing something like that. Or you could say that there is some probability of being in both clusters, but they're more likely to be in the red cluster if they're here. Um, it, so this is like a distribution of so, um, so how would you do this? So um, I don't have time to go into too many details, but you would you run it again like Lloyd's algorithm instead. Um, except what you do is you build a model for each of the clusters. So you think of this as a as a um, as a model of the of the data. Um, let's see. And what you do is you find which of these distributions is the most likely distribution that to to contain a point. And you assign a point based on its most likely distribution. And then at this thing, instead of fitting the closest point, um, or uh, yeah, so this is instead of the closest point, it's the most likely. And then instead of the average, you need to rebuild the model on the points in, in, inside of that cluster. So if you're building a Gaussian distribution, you can, you know, there are different ways of fitting a Gaussian to it, but you, um, one way is to find, again, pick the center as the mean, but then you want to decide how much variance you have in your data. And you can use, do something like that by, um, you know, by actually calculating the variance of your data so then use that as the width of the, of the cluster. If you're doing multiple dimensions, you don't need to have uniform. You could have um, one cluster look like this, and and and, and a, another one looking like this. Yeah, but, but which cluster should have what kind of variance? How should we like? Well, you you would you would look at the data, right? So this would be the cluster you would fit if your data looked actually looked like this, and this one the, the data would look like this. So what you do is you you estimate. You can estimate the center point by just the average, the same way that we're doing here, and then you do something like the you you you, you do something like um, like the PCA on the data, and we'll talk about this in a week, a couple weeks or two, if you haven't seen this before. You can estimate the PCA, and this gives you the variance in different directions. Um, tells you how much variation is there along this direction, and this is the strongest direction. And so then. You can fit clusters that adapt to the data a little bit better. Um, so uh, I, um, I, I think you would, because you don't know the shape of the data ahead of time, you would still probably use something like k-means plus plus to seed it. Um, and then you would, uh, um, you would run the same similar void step. But now the average does the center plus the PCA. And then this is based on the likelihood, which one um, you, you could then just define the probability distribution. You could say, was the probability of, of it being in this red cluster or the probability of being in the green cluster? And whichever one is higher, that's which one you assign it to. Um, so th there are some technical details that I won't go through here, but um, to, this is called like the, the, the EM thing or the mixture of Gaussians. Uh, there are Lloyd like algorithms to adopt. And those will avoid some bombs like this. Um, OK, the, the, I think one of the last things I want to talk about is there's this k-median problem as well down at the bottom. And this one is going to avoid some of the problems with k-means, where k-means will be susceptible to these outlier points. 
could, you could put too much emphasis on points which are outliers, where the key median is going to do um, something which is um, more, more stable to these outliers. Okay, so, so the question is, can you run Lloyd's algorithm to optimize the K median cluster? So, so how would you how would you change things, or do you need to change things? If I if I run the same algorithm, am I going to be optimizing the this K median problem? So the question is like. Yeah, well this, the cost function, I never wrote it in the algorithm, right? It's people, I think Lloyd invented this algorithm and people used it without realizing what the cost function was. People thought it was optimizing this for a long time, actually. Or not everyone, but some people did. Um, so I don't have the cost function written anywhere here. Um, okay, so, then, so, so let's look, there are two steps here, right? The first step is I'm assigning points to a certain center based on if it's closer to that center. And I argue that I could write the cost function here, and I'm minimizing this because the cost of each of the points is decreasing. Now I got rid of the square, now it's the right cost function. The still, this part is going down, so I'm still decreasing this, right? So this step is still correct. I'm still decreasing my cost function. Next, I want to do this where I broke, broke it into these, into these sets, and each set I want to choose the center. And so I want to minimize for each set the choice of the center. Now this, now I, I used this average before, and I said that this minimizes the sum of the squared distances. That means, this may not have the same point at the minimum, and in general, it doesn't. Um, in, in, in general, um, this is actually harder to optimize. The reason people use Lloyd's is because this, the, the average minimizes this, but.